Welcome to another session here on Fast Casual Global. Uh, we are going to dive into, I think, what um, many of you really kind of have talked to us over and over about is kind of this evolution of where Fast Casual is moving. And, you know, there was an era when we had kind of this thing called Fast Casual 2.0. It was kind of the jump between when Panera was really moving, and this has, you know, been in the late uh, part of the 2010s. And uh, it, it kind of evolved a little bit in terms of the kinds of fast casuals that were starting to populate the land. Now, of course, we've got a forced measurement at our hand uh, that is kind of pushing restaurant brands and fast casual concepts into a complete new uh, zone. Uh, so today with me, I've got two experts, Mr. Sean Schenkel, who is with Fresh Technology, and Dan Simpson of T T Tzatziki's Cafe. Great to have both of you on the, on the episode today. It's great to be here. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, great to be here. Looking forward Dan, to the combo. Yeah, Dan, I haven't had a chance to meet you in person, so it's great to meet you virtually. Uh, love Tzatziki's and, and everything you guys are doing there. Uh, Sean, let's start up with you quickly. A little about Fresh sure. Technology, obviously part of the Fresh Hospitality Group there with Matt Bodner and the team in Nashville. Talk to me about what you guys do and how you're connected to, to Tzatziki's. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> Fresh Technology is a... Um, it's a, a tech company built to um, drive some core uh, technology to um, increase digital, um, uh, you know, sort of the e-com business of a restaurant and then help manage the kitchen and the, uh, the, the back office um, um, the systems in, in restaurants as well. So uh, Dan and I work really closely together. So we, um, we get to uh, experiment a lot on new technology with, uh, with Tzatziki's. And so we, they, they get the benefit of um, early tech before we, before we release it out. And so, you know, all of the ups and downs that that brings. Um, and at the same time, we, we collaborate quite a bit on, you know, sort of our true, um, you know, the true desire is what are the problems that we can solve and what are the problems that we can use technology and innovate um, with technology to solve in the restaurant. And so it's an exciting time. I mean, it's a, it's a hard time, obviously, coming you know, as we've moved through COVID, um, but from a technology perspective, um, it's like there have just been so many, um, so many opportunities, um, so many uh, that, that tech can step in and really help um, evolve the, um, not only the efficiency, but the, the revenue um, of, um, of restaurants. So that's kind of what yeah, we do. For sure. And uh, I like it. Yeah. And I like the fact that, you know, with you guys being operators as well as technologists, um, you, you get a chance to really kind of build the measurements of what works, what doesn't work, and then apply it into some of the development of, you know, your, your technology stuff. So that's great that you guys are going in that direction. Dan, uh, give me a sit rep on Tzatziki's right now. Where do you guys stand in terms of unit count, you know, size, scope? What's a, what's a unit look like there? Yeah, we are um, just about 100 units. We ended up uh, having two casualties during uh, the first part of the pandemic last year. And um, we're, but our typical unit is about 3,000 square feet. Before COVID, we were already moving towards a 2,000 square foot more off-premise optimized model. Yep. And um, as we turn the corner into 2021 now, uh, we continue to look to provide more flexible uh, prototypes uh, that are that are more empowered by digital. So this conversation is very timely. Yeah, very cool. Interesting that you said that you, you had already started the process of going to the smaller footprints. Uh, when you look at the landscape today of where Fast Casual is, because that's exactly the topic is, what is shifting in the design of the prototypes and the new development of Fast Casual? What's the one thing that you think, Dan, is most important on your checklist of these are the things we got to do in 2021, whether it's an operational standard, a tech standard, you know, something around real estate, what would be on your number one uh, list today? I think right now is, I mean, it's very hard to have one thing. We actually establish five OKRs every year, five company objectives, and yep. they all work very much in concert with each other. But I mean, it is it is a, a balancing act of staying, listening carefully to what guests are wanting. And what that means is uh, becoming awesome at all of the omni channels. 
Uh, we were already moving someone into that, and the technology that Sean and his company provides for us uh, was allowed allowed us to be in a good position when the pandemic hit. Um, and so I, I would say if anything is we we were successful in opening all the channels this year, we have to be get to a place where we're awesome at yeah. all of the channels. And that involves lots of that's a technology, but it's retraining, it's reevaluating our footprints um, and the flow within our physical restaurants. Um, and we're getting ready to launch a new uh, version of the app, which applies some of the learnings from last year to make it again. Yeah. Uh, my line goal yeah. would be every channel like is the, equally so, awesome. So the the applications are really starting to take hold in the industry in terms of, you know, where the consumer demand has kind of shifted. Uh, obviously, that that whole model has moved uh, quite a bit, which is pushing several of the operators and concepts like yourself into some new you know strategies. And the fact that you guys are already kind of tied into really uh, moving advanced or advancing forward very quickly. That connection, Sean, over to what you guys are doing at Fresh Tech Technology, um, how does that play into, because you're, you're, I'm assuming you're trying to rethink how technology is going to be used in these new formats, potentially different size of menus, maybe even user experiences Absolutely. because you have to deal with off premise. Yep. What what's the thing that you guys are watching for mostly right now? Well, I think from a tech from a technology uh, perspective, there we see quite a bit of um, evolution in in what the user experience requirements are that we need to provide. So, um, you know, omni channel off premise. Those are these, these sort of have all collapsed into the digital world. Um, you know, I think, you know, Dan's company has been focused, I would say, off premise, especially from a catering perspective for years. And um, and so and then several years ago, we started focusing on what does it mean to expand digital for all of the economic reasons and the user experience reasons and the trends that we've seen that were sort of slowly being adopted by users. You know, we've seen those speed up. It's, it, you know, a lot of us in the industry have talked considerably about how the pandemic has, you know, um, thrown our business, our industry forward by years when it comes to a technology right. perspective. So what we're looking for, what we're focused on is now um, <clears throat> how do we provide a better um user experience with the technology and that doesn't just mean although it does mean this is the idea of being awesome in every area it definitely means in app and on web but it also means um you know backstream into operations right um i like to say that or you know uh, we, we we talk about this idea that in the late 90s and early 2000s you had retailers putting up websites where they they were um, just selling the same products they had in their big box stores. Mm -hmm. But then you had Amazon who came along and said, we need to reimagine the entire supply chain yep. from the warehouse to the consumer. Sure. We are in a period where we have to really reimagine the entire supply chain because the physical um, plant of the restaurant dining room right. is, is, is shrinking, is going away, and in response, all of these channels are opening up. So from a technologies perspective, we have to think, well, how do we balance that? How right. do we manage the flow? How do we manage these experiences? Because you've got consumers that aren't just waiting in a dining room, they are now equally, you know, equally waiting at home or in their cars. And so, you know, digital takeout online ordering is just not a bolt on, it's really become yeah. part of the core technology stack and operational experience as well. Yeah. What that's what we we see in our sort of looking at. Yeah, you know, I continue to research this topic around consumer science a lot and I get a chance to talk to a lot of um, you know, consumer behavior uh, experts so to speak, everything from PhDs to doctors. And a lot of what they're telling me is that this whole shift that has occurred in this past um, you know, year is that the psychological impact on UX, uh, how consumers are going to interface with brands is really in flux right now. It's it's in a state in which you know many brands, you know, a handful. I would say, you know, when you look at someone like, uh, well, I'll, I'll look at someone like a Chipotle or even someone way up the line like Amazon, that have been able to somewhat put the pieces of this puzzle together. I mean, you can even look at, at to a certain extent. I know, you know, 
at the time this is recorded, Robin Hood's in the news, but their gamification of stock trading, all of that is preying or, or in some cases enhancing a consumer's interface with a brand. With that happening uh, in the restaurant industry, because you're gonna find, I think, really sexy, really well done apps and ordering processes that are just so fluid that it's just going to make brand loyalty a thing. You know, if you're able to achieve that with, say, someone like Tzatziki's and what Dan's doing, do you think this could be the differentiator for the next level of fast casual operator? I'll start, but I think, Dan, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. But sure. Um, yes. And I think the certainly above the waterline, but there's also aspects below the waterline. Right. We, on the technology side, have to evolve the user experiences in our tech so that, like you said, this, the, the UXs, they become more sophisticated, they become personalized, they become more, right. um, you know, sympathetic or sort of symbiotic with the brand itself. Mm -hmm. um, we definitely have to do that. And if we only do that, but yet we just dump those orders and those technologies into the kitchen without thought on how the operations are impacted, we'll be great at capturing users moving into the restaurant and then put a new burden and pain inside of the restaurant that can create a poor user experience on the fulfillment um, and the delivery side of right. the food. And so I think that's our challenge in tech, in, um, in the restaurant business is it is an experience piece and that's a key component for evolution, mm -hmm. but we have to also be really focused on how we can marry that with operations so that they can also deliver on those promises that we're creating yeah. on, the tech, on the, on the tech side. Dan, to that point, uh, how are you dealing with that? Because you've got this ramped up tech stack and expectations from consumers that, you know, instant gratification, I want this, I want to be able to customize my order. That's got to be a nightmare for, for an operation, especially when they're not standing in front of you. Yeah. You know, they're, they're outside the restaurant. How are you guys dealing with that? Yeah, so I mentioned before when COVID came, we were fortunate that we had a digital platform that allowed us to do takeout. We were in the process of rolling out curbside, but not the whole system had not adopted it quite yet. Um, and we were experimenting with both in-house delivery and third-party delivery. And we had catering the platform already. And then we, we had a order from the table technology set up. But having the technology is one thing, implementing it so your operators mm -hmm. can execute it is a totally different thing. So we saw, and then and then ultimately to meet the expectations of, of your guests. And now yeah. you have the, all these splintered, fragmented where this guest is comfortable coming in the store. In fact, that's their preference. Right. This guest wants to come in, grab a bag and leave. This guest would prefer you bring it out to the car, uh, yeah. to a curbside parking spot, et cetera. And, um, and so you're, you're now, now we're meeting guest expectations, but our, our, we probably got about a 30 day window where there was a grace period. And we said, they were so grateful for any restaurant that was open and anyone trying to make an effort to serve mm -hmm. them. Um, but then the grace period was over and our accuracy complaints went through the roof <laughs> for good reason. It broke everything. Yeah. We weren't ready yeah. for it. And so other than unlike other brands who called me and said, we've seen your app, we've seen you've done so quickly, you pivoted so fast, your business model, you shrunk your menu to a quarter of what it used to be and you were agile. And I said, and they, and they weren't, they weren't ready with the technology. They didn't, they, it, they're going to be, you know, many, many months behind. And I said, yes, but it's broken a lot of things. And now, not only do we have to figure out how to reinvent our operations, retrain mm -hmm. everyone, but then we have to also then find a way to bring back a key element, which is for us, our first brand value is connection. Yeah. And we yeah. have worked very hard to build relationships with our guests. And so now we have to take that relationship and squeeze it down into a five second interaction or a 10 second interaction. Or in some cases, I have to go to Sean and say, help me figure out a way that if I never get to see the guest, how do I bring that zeitgeist, that uh, emotive brand quality, the the brand vo the founder's voice and heart into this experience, and how do we make that go right. into a, a little box that's designed with ones and yeah. zeros, right? So 
I think it's it's on some level, guys. Look, let's be real. This last year has not been a time where we sat back with the luxury of fine tuning sort of exotic UI right. UX. It's been survival, yeah, exactly. And in survival, we just turned on every spigot we possibly could to just serve guests and not go out mm -hmm. of business. Now we're doing the hard work of really refining uh, the operations and layering back in upgrades that allow us to uh, make sure that the experience gets to things you're talking about, which would be like, yes, we want to get beyond with our marketing and our communications in the app and in general, where you're not doing mass mass, mass messages right. or mass marketing, Much you're more doing more one-to-one -one experiences. Yeah. yeah. So we have hopefully the luxury in 2021 to do more of those things. I, and I like the 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 candor with you, uh, Dan, in the sense that, you know, you, hey, listen, you are going to break some things, but we are in a, a really, as this session kind of talks about, this is kind of the reinvention the reformatting of what's going to happen in the restaurant industry. The question I have is, and this is to you and uh, both of you, Dan and, and Sean, is do you think this particular situation with the consumer demand as it is today, which is plus 50% in most successful fast casuals that's away from the restaurant, do you think this is something that is right. going to hold for years to come? Because we're, we're spending a lot of money on developing both prototypes, tech, operational standards, all this stuff is changing and shifting for a market that could or could not be there. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take this one, Sean, and then pass it back to you. Go ahead, Dan. You dive, yeah. Yeah, my first answer yeah. is yes, because the trend lines were already moving this direction before COVID. And right. now this feels yeah, a bit right. trite to say this because it's overused, but COVID right. accelerated, right? It was the accelerator sure. of things already in motion. So we, in the time that I've been um, helping to lead to Zikis, we saw dine-in go from 70 to 80% of our business. And to Sean's point, that was augmented by corporate catering and a little bit of takeout. And before mm -hmm. COVID even hit, we were already at a 50-50 dine-in off-premise. And at that point, our digital sales made up about 12%. Right. So when the pandemic hit, we have now we then shifted to well for a little while 100% off premise, but we've settled in to where off premise is about 75% of our business sustained for the last six months, and dine in is no more than 30. Um, catering has gone from 15% of the business down to five to seven percent of the business. So the question is, where are we going? How much of this sticks? I do think dining will come back, but I, we don't think any more than to 40% of our yeah. business, which means we've invested in real estate that's too yep. big and the kitchens are not really optimized for the right thing. And we're going to have to address that. Um, but guys, there's a lot of upside to this, right? We, we all know that also the digital orders and the off-premise orders have the capability of being higher basket mm -hmm. size and more frequency. And you can actually have a smaller customer base who's more loyal. And there's a lot of upside. I would say one last thing, and this is to say the displacement of the American workforce is the real lasting challenge we have got right. to address. It's it, people didn't vanish. They weren't raptured. They've <laughs> moved for where they're working from and how we feed them where they yeah. are is our great challenge we need to focus our energy on. Yeah, and I think that's that opens up a whole new you know series of questions around this. We've talked about it on our shows on the network many times, is kind of the urbanization departure away from some of the urban centers, the explosion of some of the markets in these, um, you know, these suburban markets, real estate's shifting uh, landscape of where the demand is being done. Sean, when you look at this, all right, so you, you guys are working together, which a lot of companies, though they say they partner with technology companies, it's not necessarily like what you have, which is more brethren approaches. I feel like this gives you guys a really immersed opportunity to really make big changes at the tech stack to really kind of help Dan out um, in the sense of what he's trying to achieve. When you see that kind of challenge, do you feel like this speeds you guys up or does it just com create complexity in really understanding? Because in the past, the, rest, <laughs> the restaurant industry was, hey, we all know it, we were kind of slow uh, to react to tech and yeah. it took us years to get there. You don't have years anymore, Sean, <laughs> you got months. <laughs> Yes is the answer to everything you just asked. It is the piece that we sort of grapple with every day. And um, 
you know, as a company, we grew a lot this year. We took in, you know, we had spun out. We are, you know, a separate entity. Dan and I, you know, we, we've got offices that are very close to each other. And, and so we are very much brethren that are doing this. And part of the reason we spun it to grow it is because we needed to bring in additional resources to, to sort of meet the challenge that um, I think your, your question is, yeah. is you know, addressing. And so whether it be, you know, growth and scale yeah. or solving new problems. Mm-hmm. And I think, um, and so we went from a sleepy, slow industry to, from a technologies perspective exactly. to a tech centric business yeah. model. Yeah. And I think, you know, as we look at the changing, um, and, and this is what I'm so thankful for, you know, for Tzatziki's, for Dan, for the ability for us as a, a technology company to just, and it's not even just partner, but it's live every day inside of the problems and the solutions. Um, because, um, you know, we are both in, in our DNAs as companies, operators and technologists. And so those things have sort of been fused together. Here's what I think I, we see happening more and more. And I think, you know, um, water will seek its level when it comes to where is the workforce going to be and how are they right. going to interact. Mm-hmm. But I think what the pandemic did, at least what we see with the restaurants, with tzatzikis, with, with others, is they have really made it truly more viable for users to access a restaurant through different means than they sure. usually did in their minds, in their habits. And so we have to, and so you will see dine in come back up. People like to go out to eat, but they're going to, but, but our job is to take that, that vision of um, how do we take in, in Tzatziki's case, the idea of connection and present it in all of these, maybe they're not totally new, but they're now fully recognized as channels of, um, in, you know, as channels of engagement, and then bring it back and make the operations, you know, work. And here's the second thing. I think users are going to, uh, consumers, guests are going to demand higher quality in all of those channels as well. They have traditionally demanded a higher quality experience when they go into dine-in. Now they're going to demand higher quality with takeout, mm-hmm. accuracy, food temp, foods that travel, delivery, you know, is that is it a good quality? Is it cold? Is my curbside on time? Right. You know, so we're going to just see. So the challenge is large yeah. because we need to think through not macroly just the trends at a high level, but also all of the micro sort of nooks and crannies on how the stuff we're doing from a technology perspective impacts the operator and guest experience. Yeah, for sure. This, in this, you know, I wish we had two hours to talk about this. There's so many questions I want to ask you guys. Uh, Dan, I want to go back to you for a second. And this is moving toward kind of the supply chain uh, management side that uh, Sean alluded to, because that, that's a huge thing of being able to connect the dots in terms of supply chain, adapt that to a new business model that has less dine-in more drive through or uh, pick up, take out, delivery, third party, food that's traveling. Um, how are you guys adjusting from a menu standpoint to deal with that? Yeah, great question. In our particular model, we had a, uh, basically we're set up where we had a core menu that all stores had to adopt and then we had a list of optional items and then some test items. And that led us to, uh, to 20, more, north of uh, 25 menus, uh, too many menus to manage. So one of the things we we learned through all this is when COVID hit, we went down to a very small express menu, and we've actually been in conversation with our FAC and our our franchise partners in the last couple of weeks about moving to two or possibly mm-hmm. three uh, uniform menus, um, so we can better leverage purchase agreements. We can make use of limited uh, distribution center uh, challenges and costs there, and then ultimately optimize. Um, our ideal labor model yeah. is to go along with these menus. And so the simplification of things has become important because the challenge is even for those that have been fortunate as we have to come back in sales to where we're 85 to 95 percent of the way back um, to, to 2019 level sales, right. those sales have come at a higher cost. And so now we have to have a profitability exercise of looking through our P&L top to bottom, how to be more efficient. This is one of the ways to do it. And so I think on the other side of this, guys, there's so many gifts that are coming through any crisis. And this particular one, 
we will end up with a more streamlined menu, a better labor model. Uh, we will have a 3,000 square foot model, a 2,000 square foot model, and we have a prototype for a 1,000 square foot model. So a one, two, three uh, on, our, on our build out cost and our prototypes to go along with these new flexible menus. And we will end up being really mm -hmm. a more profitable business that's more attractive to scale. And so candidly, these right, are all things right. we knew we need to address, but they might've taken us five years. Yep. And instead they took us five months and we're small enough where we're agile enough to be able to tackle these problems um, and yet big enough where we can implement them. So it's, yeah, a, that's it's dynamic sure. Dan, you said uh, from a franchise positioning uh, scenario there, how much of Tzatziki's is franchise? We're about uh, two thirds franchise and one third company owned stores. Okay, so with franchise, um, you know the the typical scenario there, things move a little bit slower. Um, have you seen a marked improvement from the franchise community? Obviously, it's it's survival of the fittest, but have you seen improvement of of people's you know their mindset, their group think? to move quickly uh, to these decisions that have to be made faster now than what most franchise communities used to make decisions. Are you seeing any kind of movement there? Yeah, it's a great insightful question. I would say in March and April when the pandemic first hit, um, I was incredibly proud of both our executive team and the corporate staff and all of our franchise partners. Everyone uh, went from probably denial to Re realizing mm -hmm. that this is upon us and we have to act fast. And so we did. And um, and so that was great. Now I'll say as time has moved along, um, some of that resolve has softened. And I'd say where we sit today is there's a mix of this cautious optimism right. mixed with uh, some, some worry, some fear, and some understandable nervousness. And that is slowing down the process a bit. The, our response to that is we've – We've increased our level of transparency and communication with our not just our fact, but all of our franchisees. We've moved to now a, um, a monthly owners only or franchise yeah. partner yeah. call where it's a forum where we're navigating through. These are the initiatives we're working on, inviting them to be a part of it and helping us make decisions uh, more quickly. We step our toe. We make some decisions too fast, right. too slow. Right. But we're having open dialogue with our partners yeah. about yeah, it for sure. Which is cool. I think that's the that's going to be one of the big humps that a lot of uh, systems have to overcome is is getting past the the franchise community. Because I mean, I know you guys in many cases are having to get a group uh, agreement or consensus to make big decisions like this moving yeah. forward. Before we end up on our my last question to you guys, which I, I usually do, but uh, Sean, I want to kind of target something back to you. When you look at technology development, obviously you're building for Tzatziki's and kind of that whole UX and the experience, but you're also building for Dan's operational tactics that he is doing. You know, Fresh Hospitality, you know, an operator of many brands, you got to be pulling your hair out <laughs> in, in terms of the number of things that you have to be doing for all these different uh, concepts. It's true. <laughs> I've only got, I'm looking here and I've got one hat that's higher than night? the other. That was, you know, my hair. But um, the, uh, um, there are a lot of demands and it's, I have a great team. Um, and, and actually all of our brand partners, um, you know, operators are, um, op, they, they, they are trying to serve guests, make great food and drive a profit doing it. And it's a hard job. Um, yeah. you know, it's, it's a hard yeah. job. And so we want to do everything we can to, um, help them win help them succeed at that. And so it's a, it's, there are a lot of demands that come in because everybody is working their way sort of through this wilderness you know, and, and so, um, I've got a good, we've got a good team that <clears throat> works hard every day to sort of prioritize what and sort of, we, we really had to address, right. Hey, what are the core problems that we're trying to solve versus this idea of a solution that a partner may have brought to us? Um, and it's sort of core when it comes to product management from a technology's perspective. Mm -hmm. But the idea yeah. is when you break it down, there are some key operational and technological problems that um, many times can have different faces from a solution standpoint. But when you break it down yeah. to what the core problems are, they get similar. Um, it is things like 
it is my experience and my upsells on the app, but can I streamline all of that into, you know, very specific methodologies in the KDS, in the yeah. takeout management, in the labor management, you know, and if I can, if I can sort of funnel this and translate it from a variety of individual experiences out in the world to a very focused process oriented experience into operations, then that's how we see um, we can help them win. And these aren't things that we just, we need their help as partners to understand that because we don't believe we are good at building tech and working through those, those um, approaches, but we're not, we need to be, we're not trying to tell the operators what to do. We're right, trying to right. understand how to help them best solve those problems. Yeah, which I can imagine the the learning curve right now, just because of the dynamic changes that are occurring over on the operational side is, I mean, for all technology companies, it's gotta be just at a rampant pace uh, for ingestion. One last question to you guys, each of you, and it's usually something we do here on our sessions, is I wanted your opinion, is this a win or a lose uh, for 2021 in terms of what you think individually it doesn't have to be, there's no right answer. I'll start with you, Sean. Uh, win or lose on ghost kitchens and virtual brands? What are your thoughts on that? Be cautious. Be cautious. Okay. I don't know if it's a win yet. I think right. I saw some stats recently where um, it's going to kind of make small penetrations, but guests, customers want to know the stories behind their brands. They want, yeah. they don't want to just, um, they don't want to be duped. They want to yeah. know the soul behind the brand. So I would say cautious. Cautious uh, before you move. What about you, Dan? Are you in the same camp? Um, I would say for virtual brands is a win for 2021 because in extraordinary okay. times you take extraordinary measures. For ghost kitchens, I would be a bit more cautious unless you know you can drive 50 to 100 orders yeah. a day on third-party delivery. Yeah, yeah, which is uh, which is kind of the the other you know eight ball that you have in the scenario. So, it, do you feel if you had to pick a year? that we would get to um, last mile delivery without third-party marketplace. This means that e-commerce has got to be in place, apps have to be in place, and then logistics, of course, have to be in place for delivery. What year would you say that's going to be Dan and Sean? I know it's not 2021. <laughs> I haven't seen anybody <laughs> right. even close. Yeah. Uh, let's, right. let's say 2023. Let's give them okay, a like couple that. more years. A couple years. How about you, Sean? You, you kind of know what's under the hood. I was going to say 2023. 2023. I think wow. there's going to okay. be, the tech is going to be there. It's um, the, um, the P&L aspect right, of right. it. Um, that's really good. Where yeah, it's gonna this live. is going to be in. And yeah. delivery companies are going to, um, they're not going to go down easy. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to be, uh, we're going to be fighting for it every yeah, step of the right way. On, right so. on. Well, the good thing is, is I think operators kind of know the game now and everybody's figured out and they definitely understand where, where the situation lies. So it's been great. Hey, listen, it's great having both of you on the session today, Sean and Dan, thanks for uh, letting us pick your brains. We really appreciate it. Thanks Paul. Happy new year. Thanks, Paul. It's great seeing you again. And uh, Absolutely. So stay tuned for our next session right here on Fast Casual Global.